Thank you for tuning in to our POPs News Report. On April 22, 2020, the Texas U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments that allow the boyfriend, the boyfriend, of a dead mother to have the same parental rights to a child as the biological father. Yes, you heard that right. This crazy case is actually at the Texas Supreme Court. Just when you think that our judges aren't crazy enough, you know, allowing a woman to chemically alter her seven-year-old son against the father's wishes, sending a man to jail for refusal to pay alimony for a woman he isn't even married to, or forcing a man to pay over $70,000 in child support for a child that everyone, including the courts, knows is not his. The list goes on and on. Now, here's some history. On October 18, 2016, Denton County, Texas, the Honorable Sherry Shipman signs an order in suit affecting parent-child uh, relationship, granting the mother and father joint managing conservators of a one-year-old. Unlike the 90 to 95 percent of Texas orders, the father gets close to 50-50. However, as usual, so Texas can get that Title IV D money, the mother gets primary. So, from 2016 to 2018, everything works normal until the mother files a petition on January 20th, 2018 to change custody and get more child support. Presumably because she knows that Texas will remove the father's rights for that Title IV D money, um, she was already making $650 a month tax-free, but wanted more. On July 11, 2018, the mother was killed in a car accident and the child was given to the father. Now, you would think that was the end of the story. Nope. Even though the grandparents have no rights in Texas, and this was affirmed and the grandparents' claim was dismissed, now, uh, the father still let them uh, have time with the child and, and things like that, but the, the grandparents got greedy. It wasn't good enough for them, so they filed suit. Kind of saw a pattern there. The grandparents then, to go around the law, used the boyfriend, who, by the way, already has another girlfriend. <laughs> But anyway, uh, the, the boyfriend spent time, you know, off and on with the uh, then four-year-old um, and, and uh, named Pops and, and there were other things in the, in the proceeding. But uh, basically all in, spent about six months uh, living um, at, the, at the guy's house. Now, you would think that common sense would prevail uh, with this. The, the judge actually... in. Uh, <laughs> signs an order, even though there's no evidence, the father has been determined by a study to be perfectly fit. Uh, the grandparents say the fit. The boyfriend uh, says the, the father's fit. Everyone says they're fit. The, the counselor, I, everyone says it, that the, the father's fit. Um, the counselor uh, for the, the child even says that if the, the child now, I think four years old, uh, were to go to, and stay with the boyfriend, um, who has a, a, a new girlfriend now, uh, but stays there, she would regress uh, and have um, uh, problems, which actually, uh, if you read the, the documents, that's exactly, exactly what happened. After the, she signed the order, giving the boyfriend, the, the six-month-ish boyfriend, um, roughly the same um, rights as the, uh, as, as the biological father. So now the father has to provide, uh, tell the, the boyfriend about doctor's visits, school schedules, uh, let him sit in with the counselor, uh, the, the boyfriend's able to discipline, attend events, all that. Um, it, it, it's it's just it, it's crazy, and gave, the judge gave the the boyfriend a generous as was listed a generous possession schedule, which is actually above the pittance that most uh, Texas fathers, ninety percent of Texas fathers get, which is called the standard possession order. Uh, and, and again, this uh, crazy. Now the shocked father <laughs> files an appeal, and it gets denied. Now. As of August 8, 2019, this father has incurred $170,000 in legal fees fighting for this basic right. Now, the family law bar um, fought against him. I wonder why. Hmm. We'll find out more later. And now, 
The money hungry attorney general even on uh, February 22nd, 2019, files an opinion uh, saying that this is wrong. And of course, you know, the judge being drunk with power, as they all are, uh, just denies that and, and, and moves forward. Now, uh, after the, the appeals uh, didn't work uh, and everything, they went ahead and took this to the Texas Supreme Court. And I'll put a link in the, uh, in, in the video here. So if you have 58 minutes of your life that you never want to get back, uh, you can go ahead and listen to the whole thing. And there were some interesting uh, things that, you know, like uh, Justice Guzman and uh, Learman, um, they were like early adopters of calling this six-month boyfriend a stepfather. Uh, ridiculous on its own, but they were actually considering it, which is weird. Now, Justice Boyd kind of smacked that idea down, um, but I, I really wanted to kind of hone in on the uh, boyfriend. Well, let's just get real. The grandparents uh, are the ones that did this, but um, the boyfriend's attorney, uh, Michelle O'Neill. Now, she says on two separate occasions in this video uh, that parents do not have rights to the children. The courts do. And you have to listen to how it happens. Uh, 65 years of existing case law, the parental presumption is only one factor among others applicable to a suit of modification. And of course, lots of phrases like, I believe, I felt that, uh, I felt I was a stepfather, I felt this, I believe that, all that nonsense, typical. Now, she says, whenever parents are able to work it out amongst themselves, they do not need to seek court intervention. But whenever two fit parents cannot reach agreement, then they seek court intervention and they turn over to the courts their constitutional rights to make decisions on behalf of their children because they can't agree. And she says this multiple times. It's, it's, it's not a misquote. Um, now, it's weird. You can't, and two fit parents, but uh, you can't get married without the court government involvement. You can't get divorced without the court involvement. But they were saying that you don't need, they're able to work it out themselves. Again, this is the typical uh, give with one hand, take with the other. Well, take and steal from the other. Now, I can't write or summarize this long exchange, uh, but you, you just have to listen to the whole thing yourself. Uh, it's about uh, 20 to 30 minutes uh, all in of, of, of Michelle O'Neill's uh, rambling. But uh, again, you can't summarize it. It is just amazing uh, what she says. And I hope anyone that has a standard possession order went through the, this whole process is listening carefully to how all those decisions are now being used against you. Um, now, again, the father has spent $170,000, and this is as of August 2019. Obviously, probably another 20, 30, who knows. But let's just leave it $170,000. Uh, just, uh, just let it sink in that this natural right, this father has essentially bought a house. Actually, I think he, said, he said that in the court uh, transcript. He could have paid off a house with what he spent to get his natural rights to his daughter. This is just ridiculous. Now, the lawyers and the judges, of course, don't care. They've made $170,000. And now, well, there's just so many parts in here, but you're going to hear a little bit in there about um, when they say they agreed to this or whatever. And of course, us guys know what they mean by agreed to. Uh, and of course, you know, on top of that, the, there's so many things in here. Uh, the 650 that's still being paid uh, and garnished. You think the attorney general has stopped taking that money? I think we're at $29,000, $30,000 now in, in child support um, and all that. So of course, that, you know, Title 40 funding right there. So let's all see what, uh, you know, has been lost here. So that, you know, the child, of course, has lost his mother and uh, time with the remaining parent, with the father. Now the dad, he's lost time with the daughter. Uh, he's been under stress for the last several years that you just wouldn't believe. Uh, of course, $170,000, we can't forget about that. Um, $30,000 roughly in child support payments. And uh, let's see here, the state, of course they made their bonus, $72 million you know, from collecting uh, from people like him. Um, and of course the $691 million in recovery money, things like that. So we'll you know, figure out the percentages there. Uh, the attorney, now just his attorney, um, has made $170,000 and, and counting. Uh, the judges, of course their retirement funds are being taken care of and of course their self-worth and their godlike complex uh, is being uh, propped up some more. Um, the grandparents, um, you know, I don't know how much and quite frankly, since they're obviously the ones that have caused all this, I really don't care. Um, and then the boyfriend, which was his boyfriend or his girlfriend? Oh wait, never mind. Um, yeah, same answer as, as the grandparents. May it please the court. 
Ms. O'Neill will present argument for the real party and in interest. Ms. O'Neill. Thank you. May it please the court. I want to make sure that we are focused on the right question today. The question before you on this mandamus of temporary orders is whether the trial court failed to correctly analyze and apply existing law. This court is well aware of the standard for granting mandamus and that is whether there was a clear abuse of discretion with an inadequate remedy of law at law and the trial court clearly abuses its discretion when it fails to correctly analyze or apply existing law. This court and other courts of appeals cannot substitute its judgment on the factual issues, so we focus on the legal question. So the question before you, whether the trial court in Denton County failed to correctly analyze and apply the law is a resounding no. The trial court in this case followed 65 years of existing case law, beginning with the 1955 decision of this court in Taylor versus Meek. In Taylor versus Meek, this court held that the parental presumption is only one factor among others applicable to a suit for modification. Later in the 70s, the family code was codified and there was no specific parental presumption put in the modification statutes. Then fast forward to the year 2000. Following the Troxel decision, this court decided the BLK case, which again confirmed that the parental presumption is only one of several competing, even constitutional factors to consider in a modification. Incidentally, Governor Abbott was a justice on the court that decided DLK. Secretary of State James Baker wrote the DLK opinion, and our own Chief Justice Hecht was on the court that decided the DLK case without dissent. DLK has been the law of this state since the year 2000. And there is a long line of Court of Appeals cases that have underscored the DLK decision. Justice Guzman wrote in Ray Ham when she was on the Houston 14th Court in 2007. Justice Busby authored the Thornton decision in 2013. And important to the trial court in this matter, the Fort Worth Court of Appeals in PDM, and the Fort Worth Court of Appeals is the court of vertical stare decisis to the Denton trial court, authored the PDM decision in 2003. Ms. O'Neill, may I ask you, does the, the brief that was, the amicus brief that was filed by the Family Law Council, which distinguishes between the parental presumption under our Texas statute and the parental presumption that's set forth in Troxel that has to do with the fit parent, does that distinction affect your argument in any way? I think that the case law is not clear on a distinction between a parental presumption under the Constitution versus the fit parent presumption that the council uh, discusses that's statutory. My opinion is that the statutory provisions have come along as a result of the constitutional presumption. And so I, I believe that they are enmeshed into the same, not necessarily a distinguishable thing. If you will recall, um, in Mays versus uh, Hooper, um, in the year 2006, the grandparent access statute did not provide for the constitutional parental presumption. And this court found the grandparent access statute unconstitutional in 153-432, and which then led to the legislature changing the law and inserting what one might would call the fit parent presumption then into 153-432. So let, let, me, let me just ask you real quickly, let's say if the court were to determine uh, that the fit parent presumption under Troxel, Troxel is different than the presumption in our family code that presumes it's in the best, that what the, that the appointment of a parent is managing conservatories in the best interest of the child and Troxel has to do with parental decision making. If we did that, w then would you still win? Your Honor, I think that we win the mandamus because this is not the appropriate procedural time 
for the court to make new law. The court in BLK clearly said to the legislature, if you intend for there to be a parental presumption or a fit parent presumption in our modification statutes, then you need to create the law that, that puts those in there. In other words, further explaining the answer to your, private, your prior question, I believe that the fit parent presumption is a subset of the parental presumption constitutionally. I think that also on a modification, there are other competing constitutional factors. And this court has repeatedly held that the parental presumption is only one of those factors. The other factors are the right of a child to stability, the constitutional right of a child to the lines of affection that they have. So those are competing rights. There's also the constitutional level questions of race judicata. In other words, whenever natural parents can work things out among themselves, they do not need to seek court intervention. But whenever two fit parents, and I think the Family Law Council did a very good job of talking about this and talking about the Stillwell case, but when two fit parents cannot reach agreements, then they seek court intervention and they turn over to the court their constitutional right to make decisions on behalf of their children because they can't agree. And so Ms. May, may I ask you another question? Uh, in response to the excellent question that was presented by Justice Guzman that has to do with this, in this situation, the mother was a fit parent that was making the decision for the stepfather to be involved. So what is your response to that, that line of inquiry? I believe that the, the mother was the primary conservator and under the court orders, the prior court order, she was given the right to make those decisions. She introduced this gentleman into the child's life. He became a very important part of the child's life. In fact, the child called him Pops and he felt that he was the child's stepfather. In fact, he was around the child more days and had more involvement than the father did prior to the mother's death. The father had less than our normal standard access schedule. He had 14 days in the summer instead of 30, and he had the every other weekend uh, schedule that we uh, are accustomed to. But was he actually, excuse me, was he actually the stepfather or are we just using that term colloquially? Um, he had no legal obligations to the child, did he? Well, a stepfather would not have any legal obligations to a child under any law. Um, I believe that he thought he was the stepfather. He felt he was the stepfather. He was engaged to the mother and he had assumed that role as stepfather, including taking the child to the doctor and helping care for the child on a daily basis. So I think your question may go to the question of the importance of the marriage uh, ceremony versus the, um, the fact that they live together. And I think that, that my answer would go to what is in one's heart. In his heart and in the child's heart, they felt that he was a parent-like figure. And a parent-like figure is one of the important distinctions that has been made even in the recent case of HS. I believe in your, in your Justice Blacklock, in your dissent, you talk about where are the boundaries of a parent-like figure and where are the boundaries of the special weight that Troxel requires be given to parents. And so Ms. O'Neill. Yes, sir. Uh, Justice Boyd here. Yes, so Boyd. why isn't the rebuttable nature of the presumption a sufficient avenue for you to raise all the arguments that you've just made about <clears throat> the uh, stepfather and that relationship having been a closer relationship than the prior relationship that the father had? Why isn't that just something that can, can be used to rebut the best interest presumption? Your Honor, I think the easiest answer to that question is that that is not the legislative scheme that we have been given. The legislature has told us that the modification standard is material change of circumstances and best interest of the child or voluntary relinquishment and best interest of the child. And in this particular case, this was a modification of the prior order. 
The father sought affirmatively modification of the prior order. He affirmatively sought the court to appoint him as the sole conservator, which the court did on temporary orders. And the stepfather sought the modification standard of the prior orders to give him the access to continue the relationship of the child with the mother's, the mother's uh, household and affection that she had implemented. Unfortunately, the grandparents didn't have standing, and that is exactly an, a, a way of viewing this from the Troxel point of view that our legislature has parsed out the small universe of people who are able to seek a modification in this circumstance. 156 provides that we look to 102 for those standards, and this gentleman, Pops, as the child called him, was one of those people in that small universe. The grandparents were not. The, the gentleman lived in the home for more than six months, had an extreme amount of contact with the child, and the Court of Appeals in Fort Worth determined that he had standing. Right, but, but my, my point is, um, so, so statutorily, I mean, what I heard from Petitioner Relators Council is that she's not relying on the statutory presumption. She's relying on a Troxel-based constitutional presumption uh, that um, placement with the biological father is in the best interest of the child because of the biological nature of the relationship, but that she acknowledged it's a rebuttable presumption. So the fact that the child called the, the stepfather, quote unquote, uh, called him pops and that they were close and that the the deceased mother wanted that relationship and introduced that relationship. What I'm trying to understand is why that's uh, why the rebuttable nature of the I mean, so can't you just go into that modification hearing and say, look, judge, we understand that there's a presumption here in favor of the biological father, but all of this evidence, the pops evidence, rebuts that presumption in this case. Why isn't that not the sufficient balance that recognizes and respects the, bio the, the nature of the biological relationship with the father on the one hand, uh, given that you've got, under Stanley, you've got the, you know, you do have a relationship there. It's different if the biological father never had any relationship whatsoever with the child. But uh, why isn't that a, a proper way to, to, for, for the law to approach these types of cases? Your Honor, first of all, there is no case that has ever held that the constitutional parental presumption is a rebuttable part, a rebuttable presumption in the best interest standard. There is no case that has held that. What the cases have consistently held from this court is that the parental presumption is one of many factors to consider in best interest. And I think that also it, it must be said and must be reminded that this is a temporary hearing. And I disagree with Mr. Henneke that the temporary hearing standard is safety and welfare and best interest under 105. And so the court, the trial court has many competing things to weigh in a modification, even in a temporary orders on modification. I but agree. That is on there, but it sounds to me like an answer to Justice Boyd's question, you're, you're simply saying that the fit parent presumption is not really a presumption, it's just a factor, but you don't deny it's a factor. This court in VLK said that the parental presumption, the constitutional parental presumption does not apply in modifications. This, this court in VLK said that it is one of factors. It said that in Taylor also. It is also- So, so that just, does that just come down to how much weight do we give it? I think that that comes down to how much weight the trial court gives it. Yeah. I think the trial court listens to the evidence listens to the relationship of the parties, listens to the per parents' particular relationship and the status quo of the parents, and considers the right of natural parents in determining if there is a material and substantial change. The, court, the trial court also considers the stability of the child. The trial court also considers the love and affection that the child has from the competing parties. 
The trial court considers many, many, many factors, but what we cannot do, Justice Boyd, is prioritize the right of a parent over the right of the child. Those are two competing constitutional issues. And the rights of a child, both constitutionally and by our Texas Family Code, our Texas Family Code says that the best interest of the child always outweighs all of those other factors. But the, arg so, the, argument, but the argument on the other side is that the best interest of the child is in being cared for by a fit parent. I understand that that's their argument, but as this court, I, I know Justice Guzman said it in, in the in Ray Cam case, we have said repeatedly in our, in our case law that it is one of many factors. And the other factors have to be considered as well. The standard on a modification is material change of circumstances. And certainly the death of the primary parent is a material change of circumstance, at which point it puts the best interest of the child back in issue in front of the trial court. And the trial court hears the witnesses, hears the evidence, conducts a social study, for example, listens to the therapist as it did in this case, and considers a lot of varying factors of evidence. The right of a natural parent is one of those factors, but our entire foundation of, of Texas family law is, is it, it's founded upon the concept that the best interest of the child has to be the, the overriding consideration, not the best interest of the parent. And so when they say to you that it is a, it is a subset of the factors of best interest of the child, I agree with them. This court has clearly held that all the way from 1955 to the present. For 65 years, the right of a natural parent has been a factor to consider in the best interest. The, the thing that they are trying to get you to do is to elevate the right of the natural parent above the right of a child to stability and love and affection. And those are competing constitutional propositions. This court has consistently- But what, it, what your argument sounds like you're saying that you agree that there's a presumption that it's in the best interest of the child to be with the fit parent, unless evidence shows that it's not in the best interest of the child to be with a fit parent. And if that's the case, then there's no presumption at all. I, I do not believe in a modification that there is a presumption, Your Honor. I believe that in an original proceeding, there is a presumption. And the, and the legislature okay, but, but, that clear by so, adopting. But, so does that mean that, that assuming that under Troxel and Gerald D or all those different cases, Pierce even, assuming uh, that there's a constitutional um, due process um, substantive due process, which is where the U.S. Supreme Court is, has, has focused on this, assuming that there's a constitutional presumption, it would be your position that that constitutional presumption in favor of the best interest of the child does not apply because it's a modification? Yes, Your Honor, and I believe that that's what the, the precedent of this court has consistently held that the original suit is where the parental presumption is determined. And then when a modification suit is filed, the prior order is race judicata as to that parental presumption. And the parties have well, given there, over- Ms. O'Neill, is there a, a, a race judicata issue here though, since JD was not a party to the original chapter 153 proceeding? I, I believe that you're raising a privity of parties question, and that does seem to be a distinguishing factor between many of the cases. However, if we look to, for example, in Ray Cam, the facts in that case were very similar to this. The grandparent uh, was not uh, a party. If you look at PDM particularly, which is the vertical case to the court of, in this case, in PDM, the grandparent was not a party and the court clearly said that it is not the identity of parties that determines the race judicata factor. Rather, once the custody is determined, then the parental presumption does not apply to subsequent proceedings regardless of parties. 
And this That's court, the, 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 the parental presumption was never at issue. Excuse me. The, the parental presumption was never at issue in the original case because the parent, the parties were the parents. The, there's um, never been a finding that it, 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 it would overcome the parental presumption. Well, the original suit, by virtue of the fact that it did not give the father primary custody, overcame his parental presumption. It gave him access and less than standard access. And so well, but when, the, when the suit is between the two parents, there has to be a decision as between the two of them. The, the parental presumption exactly. Exactly. It doesn't come into play at all in a suit between the two parents. So there's, there's no race judicata effect when, when the court has divided custody between two parents as to the parental presumption. I disagree, uh, Judge Blackhawk. I disagree that the, that the precedent before us has not held as you suggest. The precedent before us has held that the parental presumption is determined in the original suit between the two parents and that the parental presumption does not carry forward into the modification suit regardless of the of the privity of the parties and the, the council explain, explain conceptually how the parental presumption the statutory parental presumption was decided in the original case between the two parents how does that work because the parties turned over to the court the right to determine the best interest. The parties could not, between themselves, determine the child's best interest. So the parties- How, how, how is that the case, uh, Ms. O'Neill? How is that the case when the parties uh, entered into an agreed order? The trial court signed an agreed order uh, for mom and dad. It appointed both parents uh, joint managing conservators. And the possession and access order was a custom order that the parties developed and asked that the court sign it. So how in that, how in those circumstances did the parents turn over any decision making about the child uh, to the court, given that they were not married and so had, you know, went to the court to approve their custom agreed order and their joint managing conservatorship that they agreed to. So in this case in particular, the prior order was not an agreed order as I understand it, but I, I think that you're asking me more of a global jurisprudential question. And I would still tell you that even with an agreed order, they're still submitting their dispute to the court and they're still seeking government intrusion by the signature of a judge on that order. If they wanna keep their stuff out of court and they don't want judges involved in their stuff, they have every right to keep that out of court as long as the two of them can make decisions together and not need court intervention. Courts intervene and suits affecting the parent-child relationship are filed originally because the parents need a judge to oversee the best interest of the child. And so then once that order is determined, we have relegated the best interest of the child to the court, to the government, to the state, and thereby taken away from the parents their natural constitutional right. And, and I want to make sure that we're talking about the constitutional right in the right terms. The constitutional right is the right of fit parents to parent without intervention, without intervention. And I think that the other side, all of the parties to the other side seem to forget that part of the constitutional right. It's the right to parent without intervention. And so the entire body of U.S. Constitution, uh, or excuse me, U.S. Supreme Court law has come about because of government intervention. And the parties seek that government intervention by relegating the best interest determination to the court, to the trial judge in the initial case, whether it's by agreed order or contested order, it's still relegated and it's still subject to modification in the future. The modification standard is the material change of circumstances and best interest with only one factor of those being the parental, the it's, right to that. And I guess, um, Ms. O'Neill, just as to that point that you just made, when you submit a dispute to the court, even if it's agreed, the courts do not have to accept your agreement necessarily if um, they, they find it's not in the child's best interest. And that's been a very, I guess, contentious issue over the years parents come into court because they need those orders for a lot of reasons, and yet sometimes courts refuse to accept what the parents have agreed to. Right. And that's problematic uh, for a lot of reasons. 
Well, for example, if there were domestic violence allegations, one of the questions in a proof up of an original SAPSER is whether there was domestic violence. And if there is, the court doesn't have to accept a joint managing conservatorship agreement. So those, the best interest challenges are still submitted to the court, even if the parties attempt to agree. Most trial courts accept parties agreements because that is the most efficient thing to do. And the best thing for the parties is to reach agreements and the best thing for the courts as well. But it is still a relegation of their parental right to parent without intrusion. Uh, no question here that the father's a fit parent, right? I don't think that there has been a challenge to his fitness generally, but there, I think that there was evidence, I think as to, I, I believe Justice Bland indicated kind of around this question about what, or maybe it was Justice Lehrman, I'm sorry, I can't remember now, but about whether the absence of the stepfather would be injurious to the child. And I think the other side would probably argue there's a distinction in those two questions whether absence of the parent is the issue or whether absence of the step parent, stepfather would be the issue. Any other questions? Yeah, I do, Chief. Yes, yes, if, if the original case is between the two parents and one parent dies, why isn't the original case mooted, which is what would normally happen upon the death of, of one of two parties in a lawsuit, such that we should think of the, this new case as, as an original case to which the chapter 153 presumptions would apply? I, I think that there is precedent on that question that says that it is not mooted, uh, that says that it is mooted maybe as to immediate possession, but not as to the court's continuing jurisdiction over the best interest of the child. There are numerous cases on that that discuss the fact that the court continues its jurisdiction over the child regardless of the death of the parent. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. O'Neill. Thank you. We'll hear a rebuttal from the relator, Ms. Draper. Thank you. May it please the court. Troxel tells us that a fit parent decides what is in the best interest of the child, not that it is a factor in the best interest of the child. It is not just one factor, it is the factor. It is a constitutional fundamental right. Their theory on the other side Ms. allows a- Ms. Ms. Draper, um, if I may, what does a fit parent submit to the court uh, for decision once it invites the court's um, intervention? So um, you said a fit parent decides what's in the best interest of the child. Once a fit parent um, comes into court, what exactly is it inviting the court to do? So when two fit parents come into court, they need help deciding, or they need assistance from the court in one way or another for a variety of reasons. But when two fit parents go into court, they are not giving away their constitutional rights with respect to any future non-parent down the road who's gonna come intervene in the future. And the notion that that could possibly be the case should scare every fit parent. The theory of JD's- Well, let me, let me just say, at least our statute is more narrowly tailored. They're not giving away to any person that comes down the road, just a person who's had, you know, the, the, the uh, time frame of possession, uh, care and custody. How does that impact your argument? Because it's not just anybody off, off the street. It's someone who's actually had- Sorry, connection with the child. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Your Honor. The standing statutes are more narrow than the ones in Troxel. However, in this, as applied in this case, they did not provide any constitutional protections for the fit parents whatsoever. And unless we apply those constitutional protections as part of a fit parent analysis, then the father's constitutional rights are not protected in this case. Ms. Draper, you mentioned that, uh, that uh, the parental, uh, the fit parent presumption from Troxel uh, is the factor. Is that, uh, which, does your position entail that that needs to apply in a chapter 153 uh, proceeding as well? And that uh, you, do you, is your position, would it, if we agree with you in a, in a 153 proceeding, uh, would that mean that we would also have to apply the fit per parent presumption there and that you don't think that the statutory presumption on managing uh, conservatorship is adequate to protect the constitutional fit parent presumption? 
Yes, Your Honor. The parental presumption in Chapter 153 is not sufficient to protect the fit parent presumption. If that had been applied in this case, it would not have prevented the outcome that led to a non-parent receiving rights and possession over the rights of a fit parent. Opposing counsel has tried very hard to muddy the waters for the court today and to confuse the issues. This case is not about the parental presumption in the family code, and it is not an attempt to overturn BLK and years of precedence. This case is about the constitutional rights of fit parents to make decisions regarding the care and custody of their children. The father in this case is a fit parent, and as such, he gets to determine the nature of any relationship his daughter should or should not have with JD. The Constitution protects his right to make those decisions, and the trial judge abused her discretion when she openly substituted her opinion of best interest for that of the fathers. Ms. Draper, do we need Troxel or the Constitution to decide as a matter of law that, that unless there's a problem with the parent, the parent decides what the child's best interest is? Troxel simply expounded upon the due process rights that parents already had. So this was a right that existed before Troxel, but this is a constitutional right that is as old as our country. It is one of the most important rights that we have. And my question is, do we need the constitution to, to play a role at all if we decide as a matter of law that, that parents decide what's in the best interest of their children unless there's a problem with the parent? In this particular case, there's nothing in the family code that would say that. So without the constitutional protections, there's not any family code statute for the court to apply. In there's a term best interest and courts have to decide what that means. And if it means, if it means that parents decide unless there's a, a defect in the parent, then the constitution wouldn't come into play at all, right? The fact that the constitutional protections are so important and vital. I believe it's very important for the constitution to be factored into that fit parent presumption and due process analysis and realizing that it carries significant weight. It is not just one factor to be determined compared to, you know, how long has a non-parent been in the life of the child or will the child be upset at not visiting with a non-parent? Um, this is a much bigger issue than that. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Draper. The case is submitted and the clerk will adjourn the court. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. The Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas now stands adjourned. Now, this is our judicial system. This is what we're fighting over and we're allowing it. The fact that this ridiculous case has made it this far is just baffling. That anyone involved with a clear conscience, any amount of common sense, and expending mental power on this court case is insane. How did we, mothers and fathers, allow the government and the judicial system to do this to us? Now, here's where my money's at. Up until the 1960s, divorce was actually very rare. But then, the then Governor Ronald Reagan passed no-fault divorce. And combined with the feminist revolution, changing morals, the divorce rate skyrocketed. Our government hates fathers. Well, they hate families, but they really hate fathers. And they've demonstrated over and over how expendable we are. But not our money. How they have enslaved us using the thing that we love most in this world, our children. The only solution I can see is for men to stop getting married and to stop having children. Good news is that the statistics are showing exactly that. In a gener generation, maybe two, will have fixed the glitch. Now, personally, thanks to the laws, and I have two boys, uh, my boys have vowed that they will never get married and they'll never have children, which means I'll never have grandkids. I I'll, I'll never be a grandparent. Thanks a lot. And for the people that say, well, some are good, divorce occurs over 50% of the time in all marriages. And they're initiated by women 70 plus percent of the time because they're unhappy, unilateral divorce. And after this, they receive priority custody about 85% of the time. Why would 
anyone play Russian Roulette when the gun already has four bullets in the chamber? You might as well be using a semi-auto. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good rest of your day.